as promised, Senator Bernie Sanders here. An hour late, we'll call it, uh, instead of brunch with Bernie, maybe happy hour with Brewskis with Bernie. <laughs> Senator Sanders. Good to be with you, Tom. Great to have you here. Uh, so, boy, I, I, you know, I get your newsletter. I signed up for it over at sanders.senate.gov. A lot going on on your plate. Uh, you there is a lot going on. Yes, there is. And I think <clears throat> most of the listeners know that uh, sequestration begins today, and that is a real, real tragedy, uh, to my mind, because it's a tragedy that goes beyond the people who will lose their jobs. Uh, Tom, I just came from an event at the Vermont National Guard, and these are people in Vermont. We, a lot of our people in Iraq and Afghanistan, some of these never came home. People really paid a price. Uh, and yet we're talking about uh, furloughs now, uh, people losing 20% of their pay. Uh, you're talking about Head Start being cut back, uh, nutrition programs being cut back, et cetera, et cetera. So there's going to be a lot of pain, but of more significance than the loss of jobs in the middle of a recession is this Republican ideology that despite the fact that we have the most unequal distribution of wealth and income of any major country on earth, Despite the fact that the wealthiest people are doing phenomenally well, that large corporations and Wall Street are enjoying record-breaking profits, the Republicans are absolutely adamant that they will not ask the wealthy and large corporations to pay a nickel more in taxes, and that the only way they want to do deficit reduction is by cutting, 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 cutting Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, education, student loans, nutrition, environment, you name it. And I think that is such a disastrous approach, both from obviously a moral perspective. I mean, we are seeing a middle class now disappearing. There was a piece in the paper today uh, that talked about that while unemployment remains very high, many of the new jobs that are coming online and replacing the jobs that we've lost are low-wage jobs. Mm -hmm. So we've lost middle-class jobs and replacing them with low-wage jobs, which continues the trend of the median family income in this country in the last 10 years going down by $5,000. Wow. So in the midst of all of this, this growing disparity between the very, very wealthy and everybody else, the Republicans continue their attack uh, on working families. And it's not just Republicans. They're sponsors. Groups like the Business Roundtable, it didn't get a whole lot of attention but a couple of weeks ago, Business Roundtable is a group composed of the CEOs of every large corporation in America. It's the 100 largest CEOs in the country. 100 largest. Mm -hmm. Many of these corporations are enjoying huge profits. All of these CEOs receive fantastic salaries and compensation packages and retirement packages. They came to Washington and they said, we think, we think you should raise the uh, Medicaid, Medicare uh, eligibility age to 70 years of age, and Social Security should start at 70 years of age. So you have these guys who are zillionaires, who have enormous wealth, enormous power, telling the United States Congress that we should continue to decimate working families, in this case, elderly people. So the class warfare, and I don't, you know, I, I use that word advisedly, but I can't use any other word. The rich are getting richer, and they use their wealth and their power to continue to attack uh, working families, you know, these are the folks who have sent our jobs to China and to Mexico and to every other low-wage country. And now when it comes to paying taxes, they're stashing their money uh, in the Cayman Islands and in other tax havens. Um, we recently, you know, mentioned on the floor of the Senate that the Bank of America uh, has uh, dozens and dozens of subsidiaries in the Cayman Islands. And their function, obviously, is to avoid paying taxes to the United States. And that is what uh, many of these corporations are doing. So what we have got to do uh, is to rally the American people and say, no, we do not want to become a second-class nation. We want to deal with our serious unemployment problem, which is really over 14%. We don't want to cut, cut, cut. We want to invest in our kids. We want to invest in the infrastructure. We want to transform our energy system. We want to create decent-paying jobs in America. And we don't want austerity for working families while the wealthiest people uh, do phenomenally well. 
So that is a, an issue of major concern. Um, I am also now chairman of the Veterans Committee, and we're dealing with some of the very serious problems facing the veterans community. I think as many of your listeners who are veterans know, uh, VA does a lot of things very, very well. Uh, we have a lot of very good uh, hospitals and, and primary health care clinics that are doing a really good job uh, for veterans, but we have our share of problems, and we're going to start addressing some of them, including the backlog. A lot of, uh, for a variety of reasons, a lot more people are applying for benefits, uh, and while the VA is, in fact, uh, dealing with uh, a, a, a whole lot of, of claims more than they used to, uh, they have uh, a backlog which is significant because more people are applying. So we've got to deal with that. We have to deal with the issue of women in the military. Women are now going to be in combat positions. We have more and more women in the military. They've got to uh, be treated with respect. They need their health care system as well. Uh, we have to deal with the very serious issues of post-traumatic stress disorder and tra- traumatic brain injury, and that's a, a big issue. So a lot of issues that we're dealing with uh, in in the Veterans Committee. Uh, Barbara Boxer and I, a couple of weeks ago, introduced the most significant piece of global warming legislation because at the end of the day, if we do not uh, attack and reverse uh, global warming and cut back significantly on greenhouse gas emissions, we're going to be looking at a planet which by the end of the century could be as much as 8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than it is today and what that will mean is that uh, coastal cities uh, around the United States and around the world could well be underwater. Uh, you will have more flooding, more droughts, more extreme weather disturbances, uh, like Hurricane Sandy, which will uh, cause horrendous damage and cost us huge amounts of money uh, in terms of, of rebuilding uh, costs. So, you know, we got, uh, we got the sequestration and we got the deficit reduction issue. Uh, we've got global warming. We've got veterans issues. We are working on postal reform. Uh, it, to my mind, in the middle of a recession where so many people are hurting, you don't talk about laying off more and more postal workers, and we have to protect those workers. Um, so we got a we got a table that's pretty full. Yeah, yeah. Are you? What are your thoughts on how the sequestration thing is going to play out, and why is it that yesterday? The Democrats actually got 51 votes in the Senate, which is, according to the Constitution, means the law passed for a plan to end sequestration. And yet, uh, the word filibuster, I have not seen it in any major news media, and the you president know, didn't use the well, word. Tom, you know, that's a good question. It has to do with the media and, and so forth, and it has to do with this issue of filibuster. Um, you know, we've talked about that many, many times, and everybody must know this. You know, when we grow up, when we grow up in, as kids and we go to school, uh, we we learn that an American majority rules. You know, if you're running for class president in the fourth grade, and you get more votes than the other kid, you become class president, right? All right. But that somehow uh, that rule does not apply in the United States Senate. Uh, for many many decades, there was kind of like a gentleman's agreement that the filibuster would only be used in extreme circumstances. And by filibuster, it's not a question of people talking on the floor forever. More importantly is the amount of votes it need, you need in order to move on to a vote on that issue. And since Obama has been president, the Republicans have used filibusters on virtually, well, on every piece, major piece of legislation, as well as many minor pieces of legislation. And the simple reality is it takes 60 votes to get it passed. So yesterday is a very good example. The majority rules 51 votes carries the day, but not yesterday. And that's a whole other issue that we have to continue uh, addressing. There you go. Senator Bernie Sanders with us. We will be back with your calls for Senator Sanders in our national town hall meeting, Brunch with Bernie, here on the Tom Hartman Program. We're live. It's 4.15 on the East Coast. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Back with more with Senator Sanders. Sanders.senate.gov, by the way. You can sign up for the Bernie Buzz for his newsletter. It's really worth your effort. And welcome back. Uh, Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us. It's our brunch with Bernie Hour. We are live. It's an hour later than normal, but it's not. this is not a pre-recorded show. Uh, Vera in San Diego, California. You're on the air. Uh, thank you for watching Free Speech TV on DirecTV. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. 
Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, 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 Senator Sanders, for everything you do. My, uh, the issue is uh, Social Security. We had a group of us had a, uh, scheduled a meeting with our uh, Scott Peters, who is our, our representative, uh, to urge him to uh, to uh, sign the uh, the Grayson Takano um, uh, bill uh, to protect Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and he was a no show. And we asked for something in writing in terms of his position. Instead, I got a, a very uh, we, he sent us a, you know a very form letter about the the fact that he is. Uh, Nothing about Social Security. Basically, it's part of the no labels group. Now, my impression of no labels is kind of a, you know, a, a modified um, Republican group that has some Democrats in it, but basically just wants to distance themselves um, from the, um, you know, from the the Tea Partiers. And I, uh, the, the two part question is, uh, is that a, a correct assumption on my part? And how do we, if that's the case, how do do we expose that? And the second is. Um, in the background, all of the money being spent by the uh, Peterson, uh, P. Peterson Fix a Debt Group that's spending all this money to try to uh, cut Social Security and Medicare and Medicaid so that they can keep more tax cuts for the corporations and the 1%. And it's not getting, it's way under the radar. And right. my question okay. is, what can we do as citizens? Yeah, let's get this to Bernie. Uh, thank you, Vera. Uh, you know, you did a great job in just explaining the issue. And I thank you very much for that. And I thank you very much for the work you're doing. And you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, we live in a, in a uh, nation where the media, to a very significant degree, is controlled by large corporations who have their agenda. Uh, and that's why we're so grateful for folks like uh, Tom Hartman and others who are fighting for working families and are bringing up issues that mainstream media very often does not touch upon. And you're quite right. Um, many listeners may not know. Uh, but Vera mentioned a fellow named Pete Peterson. Peterson is a billionaire who made his money on Wall Street and who has spent and will spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars setting up organizations, funding think tanks, lobbying Congress in order to cut Social Security and Medicare. That's what he is all about. Uh, so let me just go through, and I, I'm not in the House, Vera, so I don't know what that group is about, but here's the story. If anybody hears somebody on the radio or television saying, everything is on the table, that means they're going to cut Social Security and Medicare. If people tell you that, I believe in entitlement reform, they're going to cut Social Security and Medicaid. What these guys don't want to do, well, let's pick that up after the break, Tom. Okay. Now, it's 19 minutes, almost 20 minutes past the hour. It's our Brunch with Bernie hour. We're doing it one hour later than normal today, and but we are live. And more with your calls for Senator Sanders right after this. Check out his website, by the way, sanders.senate.gov. Find the media three hours a day, five days a week. The Tom Hartman program. Welcome back, Senator Bernie Sanders, with us for our brunch with Bernie hour, one hour later than normal to the, this week. And uh, Senator Sanders, uh, Vera had just called and was mentioning uh, Pete Peterson and his efforts to uh, privatize Social Security. And Vera, Vera hit the nail right on the head. Uh, these guys are by and large cowardly people. You can he hear very few of them getting up on television saying, "I think we should cut Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid." They don't say that. What they say is, I believe in entitlement reform, which means the same thing. Now, Vera, let me just tell you something that will gratify you, is that you're not alone. Every single poll that has been done says that the American people do not believe that we should cut Social Security, Medicare, or Medicaid. They believe that the wealthiest people in this country should be paying more in taxes, that we should end these loopholes for large corporations. But the problem is 
that Pete Peterson and his other billionaire friends have so much influence over the White House and the Congress. This is not just Republicans. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but the president is also sympathetic to what is called a chain CPI. Again, nobody understands what a chain CPI is. What that means is they want to reconfigure how you determine cost of living increases, not only for Social Security beneficiaries, but for disabled vets. The result will be significant cutbacks in Social Security and benefits for disabled vets. They don't have the guts to say that. They call it a chain CPI. So I'll just give you one example of something which I, I find very gratifying. Uh, just this last week, we had hearings with veterans organizations. And, you know, some people think, well, these veterans organizations are pretty conservative. Let me tell you something. Almost through an organization, they do not believe that we should be balancing the budget on the backs of disabled vets. They are exactly right. And the vast majority of the people in this country do not believe we should be balancing the budget on the backs of the elderly, the children, the sick, and the poor. This is simply an issue. It's a political issue where big money, as very indicated, does not want to pay more in taxes. One out of four major corporations that make money pay nothing in taxes. We're losing $100 billion a year because these guys are slashing their money in the Cayman Islands. But rather than change those policies, they want to balance the budget by cutting programs that working families desperately need. In a nutshell, that is the issue that we are dealing with, and that's what sequestration is all about. Andy in Teaneck, New Jersey, listening on WWRL, our New York City station. Andy, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Thank you, Congressman Sanders. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all that you do. I'm about your age, and if I had to deal with those Republicans every day, I'd be in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you for all your work. Thank you. And I wonder if these people are crazy. But my well, suggestion Andy, they ain't crazy. Yeah, and I wrote a letter to the editor. It's going to be in my local paper soon. Uh, why can't, they're talking about taxes. They don't want taxes changed. $600 billion could be saved simply by changing the Medicare Part D to allow the government to negotiate mm -hmm. the price of drugs. Mm -hmm. So why, why isn't that spoken about? All right, Andy. All right, Andy makes a good point. But let me, do, let me just be very clear. These Republicans are not crazy. They are not crazy at all. Crazy like a fox. Right. They just they don't care. They're not stupid, and they're not crazy. They don't care. Listen, I have talked to Republicans, whose names I don't have to get into right now, who believe that if you don't have any health insurance, it's not a problem. The church will take care of you. A charity will take care of you. It's not a problem. These are people who, some of whom believe that Social Security not only should be privatized or cut, they literally believe it's unconstitutional. We should not have retirement programs for seniors. We should not have any federal health care, Medicare and Medicaid. At the end of the day, what they really want to do is undo all of the progress that we have made as a nation since the 1930s and bring us back to the time when corporations and wealthy people controlled the economic and political life of this country and workers and middle-class families had very little security and very few rights. That is their vision, and that is their dream, to bring us back into the 1920s. Um, Andy asked, well, can't we save substantial sums of money in Medicare if the – uh, if Medicare does what the Veterans Administration and the Department of Defense does, they negotiate drug prices uh, with the uh, pharmaceutical industry. Well, all over the world, healthcare systems negotiate prices with the drug companies, which is why I'm sitting an hour and a half away from the Canadian border. Prices for prescription drugs in Canada are substantially less than they are right here in Burlington, Vermont, and cheaper all over the world than they are in the United States of America. So Andy says, why can't Medicare negotiate prices? Well, of course they should. But they can't because in the Bush, George, uh, George W. Bush passed Medicare Part D bill, language was put in there by the Republicans to protect the pharmaceutical industry so that we would not be able to do that. Obviously, we've got to take that language out and do it. Andy is absolutely right. Okay. Uh, we have just uh, one minute to the break. Actually, uh, that's not enough time for a, for a question. 
Um, do you see any, in, in that one minute, Bernie, do you see any forward motion on this? Any what? Forward motion. Do you, do you think things are going to get better? Well, I think, you know, clearly the Republicans are in bad shape right now. Uh, they are tough. They are adamant in Washington, but they are losing more and more support from the American people. People see them as rigid. Uh, people see them as out of touch with the needs of ordinary uh, Americans. There's a lot of profound disgust with what's going on in Washington in general, but the Republicans are uh, are being hit harder by the American people quite correctly. Uh, so I, I think that if we continue to expose what the Republicans are about, as Vera mentioned, people don't know it. They don't know it. They, people say, well, you know, it's a plague on both your houses. People do not know, and the media does not do a particularly good job in reporting what right-wing extremism is about, and they are not effective in reporting the war against working families. It's our Brunch with Bernie Hour. Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us, taking your calls. Uh, one hour later than normal today, but we are here and we are live. It's 27 minutes past the hour in the Tom Hartman program. We'll be back with more of our national town hall meeting with Senator Bernie Sanders. Our brunch with Bernie hour, one hour later than normal. It's our uh, with the East Coast 4 o'clock hour. Senator Bernie Sanders on the line with us, sanders.senate.gov, his website. Bernie, you're still here? I'm right here. Okay, let's pick up some phone calls here. Paul in San Francisco, you're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello, Senator Sanders. Um, I'm calling uh, because I wanted to thank you for the work you've been doing to save the Postal Service. Um, I saw that you introduced uh, Senate Bill 316, and part of which would repeal the 2006 uh, pre-funding requirement. That's, yep. That's basically bankrupting the Postal Service. Yep. Um, and I also saw that there's an H. Uh, there's a uh, House. Uh, uh, companion bill that uh, uh, Representative DeFazio uh, introduced. That is correct. And both of them at this point are in committee. Is there anything that um, regular folks like me can do to help push these out of committee and get some action on them? Because they just seem so reasonable and so well thought out. And thank you again. Well, Paul, what, thank you for calling. Do do? And the answer is absolutely. Uh, all over this country, uh, people are supportive of the Postal Service. They know what an important role the Postal Service plays in our local economies, especially our rural economies. They do not want to see rural post offices shut down, and they don't want to see processing plants shut down, and many people do not want to see Saturday mail delivery ended. Uh, the debate, they, well, many people don't know this. Paul's point was that the major reason, by far, for the financial duress of the Postal Service, something like 80% of the financial problem, has to do with an incredibly onerous funding requirement uh, that in ten, a 10-year ten period, the Postal Service funds 75 years of future retirees' health care needs. In, 70, uh, in 10 years, 75 years of needs. And that is that... that Requirement is unheard of in any other agency of government, uh, unheard of in the private sector. And what we do in our bill, among many other things, is end that burden on the Postal Service. We also protect six-day delivery, uh, and we establish the Postal Service does have to change. They have to be given the opportunity to raise new revenue, and there are ways that they can do that because right now their hands are tied in many respects as to what kind of options they have to bring in revenue to help them. So we're working hard on this. Uh, we have a number of co-sponsors on it, and uh, we're going to keep the fight to save the Postal Service. Okay. Debbie in Maryville, Indiana. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Thanks for watching Free Speech TV. Good afternoon, Tom and Senator Sanders. Um, I'm... Um calling today about uh, Lockheed Martin. Um, they have a contract with the United States for the F-22 bomber, which has not been fulfilled. And if the U.S. would just simply cancel that contract, it would save the United States over a trillion plus dollars. So, excuse me, rather than having hundreds of thousands of Americans go through this austerity, if you just cancel that uh, contract for that Lockheed Martin F-22, 
Uh, they've been feasting on uh, at the U.S. wartime table for decades. And just cancel it, and if they have a problem with it, you can just tell them what Senator Boehner wants to tell everybody in this country. We're broke. <laughs> um, Debbie, thanks for your, your question. Uh, I apologize for not being all that familiar with the F-22. I'm not on the Armed Services Committee. But this I do know. One of the scandals with regard to defense spending is time after time after time, uh, companies like Lockheed Martin and others come in and they say, well, we'll build you this plane. We'll build you uh, this weapon system for X amount of dollars. We'll build it for a billion. And then, because the Defense Department has not been vigorous in holding these people accountable, they come back a few years later and say, well, we told you it would cost a billion, but it really is going to cost you three billion. So the cost overruns that we see throughout the Department of Defense are really outrageous, and it's part of a plan. They come in cheap, and they end up doubling or trip, well, whatever it may be, significantly increasing the cost of uh, production. So you make a very good point, Debbie, and I think taking a hard look at defense spending and ending those types of abuses is one way that we can and should go forward in deficit reduction. Okay. Patty in Towson, Maryland, listening on Sirius Satellite Radio. Patty, thanks for calling. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi. Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Can you hear me okay? Fine. Great. Senator Sanders, thank you for your service. My son's a big fan. He's 14 now. We met at the Burlington Airport in, uh, when he was like nine years old, and he knew who you were right away. Big, big fan of yours. Um, but I wanted to ask, um, I understand that the sequestration is actually a series of cut to the budget increases um, coming up for this fiscal year. And I wanted to see if I'm understanding that correctly. And if that's so, then when do they actually start taking effect? Are we on a budget now? Or are we still on continuing resolution? I'm trying to understand the I know. It gets problem. complicated, Patty, and uh, it is hard to keep up with. Uh, no, the continuing resolution uh, does not uh, end until the end of this month, so we're not on that, and that's going to be another whole debate or else the government shuts down. Uh, what this is about, what sequestration is about, is an agreement reached by the super committee who were asked to come up with a deficit reduction uh, plan, and they failed, and this was the alternative, and the alternative was $1.2 trillion over a 10-year period. That's $110 billion, uh, a year. Uh, given the fact that we're three months into the year already, this applies, I think, to eight or nine months. It'll be about $85 billion, half military, half uh, non-military, uh, including Head Start, education, and other important programs in addition to military. Uh, that goes into effect today. Uh, but it's not going to mean that everything happens today. It's going to be spread out over a period of time. Some of these cuts will come sooner, some will cut later. Many government agencies right now are beginning to implement uh, some of the changes, but it'll depend agency by uh, agency. You know, my hope is, my hope is uh, that in fact we can reach an agreement where the Republicans see the light and understand that we need revenue uh, and that we can come to an agreement uh, to end the sequestration. Pete in Columbus, Ohio. Hey, Pete, thanks for listening. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Yeah, hi, Tom. Uh, Senator Sanders, a company called uh, the Scooter Store was raided by the FBI last week um, and that was reported in the press, uh, allegedly for medic Medicare fraud uh, and on a massive scale, if true. Um, is it not time to start taking these, 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 these companies to trial rather than letting a settlement just be a cost of doing business? Uh I, I, Pete, that's a good question. Uh, in general, I would agree with you. Uh, I don't know. You know. I suppose that the Department of Justice has to look at it case by case. Uh, there is an enormous amount of Medicare fraud. There is no question about it. Uh, sometimes it's small companies. Sometimes it's doctors. Uh, and sometimes, by the way, it is large pharmaceutical uh, companies who are ripping off both Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, and you're right in saying that I know with the pharmaceutical industry, uh, some of the settlements with the biggest, some of the biggest drug companies have uh, resulted in settlements rather than acknowledgement of guilt. 
and uh, I, I am troubled by that. If you're ripping off the federal government intentionally, uh, you should be found guilty. Uh, they should take you to court. You should be fined. Uh, and whether or not you should be able to continue to sell your products for the federal government is, is, is a question that should be considered. Corky in Hilton, New York. Oh. You're, you're on the air with Corky? Oh, it's Andrew Sanders. You're on here. Yep. Yeah, I, uh, I was hoping that you could stay strong for this sequester because let them hit their big donors. That's the military complex. We can withstand, we can withstand some of these cuts. But they're coming after the Democratic voters, and I would submit to you that their biggest campaign donors are the military complex contractors. And they're going to come crying and screaming in a couple months when these guys start getting on their case. The it's about time we stand up to these guys. Well, Corky, if, if the point is that military contractors have enormous power, you're absolutely right. Uh, we have seen, among other things, a revolving door in Washington where many generals and admirals leave the United States Armed Forces and end up working for some of these companies. They have a lot of power, and they have a lot of money. Uh, and I, as I've said earlier, uh, believe that at a time when we have, we are now spending three times as much as we did in 1997 on defense, I think we can make judicious cuts in military spending and do it in a way that's wise. The problem with the sequestration is it cuts across the board. It is not wise. It is not looking at priorities. It is not looking at wasteful systems that might be eliminated. Uh, where other systems, in fact, or parts of the military budget might be strengthened. So it's a bad way, clearly, uh, to do uh, business. So um, I oppose the sequestration. I'm a member of the Budget Committee, and I hope we can come up with a budget, which is a, which is a sane budget, uh, which deals with deficit reduction by cutting military spending and asking the wealthy and large corporations uh, to stop paying their fair share of taxes. We will be back with more. Senator Bernie Sanders taking your calls in our national town hall meeting, Brunch with Bernie, in just a moment. Be sure to check out uh, Senator Sanders' website, sanders.senate.gov. You can sign up for the Bernie, Bernie Buzz's newsletter, which keeps you up to date on what is going on in Congress and around the country. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit TomHartman.com for audio and video archives. And one of our callers today is going to receive a free autographed copy of Rebooting the American Dream, 11 Ways to Rebuild Our Country, sent out by Stamps.com. It's the book Bernie read from the floor of the Senate. Welcome back, and Aaron in Malibu, California, watching on Dish Network on Free Speech TV. You are on the air with Senator Sanders. Hello. I would sing your praises, Senator Sanders, but time is running short. So <clears throat> are you somewhat concerned about Obama um, being on TV last night, talking about how everything is on the table, including entitlements? I am very concerned about that, and we have been opposing Obama for many, many, many months on that issue. Let's be clear. I mean, what you have right now is you have an extreme right-wing Republican Party who wants to decimate virtually every program that working families need. And in a short while, I imagine, uh, Congressman Paul Ryan, who is the Republican candidate for vice president, is chairman of the Budget Committee in the House. He's going to present the budget. It is going to be a devastating budget. There will not be a nickel in new revenue. He's not going to ask the wealthy to pay a penny more, but he will decimate virtually every program that working families need. That's the Republican Party. The Democrats clearly are better. But for whatever reason, you have the President of the United States pushing this concept called the chain CPI, which I described before, which will result in significant cuts for Social Security beneficiaries. Uh, if you are 65 today, by the time you are 75, uh, that cut will amount to about $600 a year, and by the time you're 85, it'll be about 1000 bucks a year. And it's also a cut for disabled veterans. I think that is totally and absolutely absurd. So I formed a caucus in Washington. We are fighting it, but if you're asking me, am I concerned? I am terribly concerned. So I would urge uh, listeners uh, to have uh, to call members of Congress, their House members, their Senate members, and say, 
no cuts to Social Security and Medicare. Linda in Lorena, Texas, watching Free Speech TV on Dish Network. You're on the Euro Senator Sanders. Hi, I'm a first time caller and a disabled vet. Um, and I have, uh, I think that we should put more strings attached to tax breaks and tax money that we give, uh, to the public. Uh, for example, uh, do you know that Baylor Healthcare Systems, which is very large in Texas, in, along with the academic system, um, does not accept Champus contracts, tri- TRICARE t- contracts, uh, and their doctors that are affiliated with their hospital uh, usually will say that they've filled their Medicare uh, uh, quota and, furthermore, that they don't accept Champus or TRICARE consignment. Okay. Um, the uh, doctors here, unlike lawyers, have to also pay, uh, a, 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 uh, they charge the same rate whether a nurse practitioner sees you mm-hmm. or a, uh, a physician's assistant sees you as a doctor's fee. They should be staggered like it is in the legal profession. If a legal assistant does your paperwork, you charge a legal assistant's fee. Uh, you don't charge for the lawyer's rate. Um, there Lin- should be... Linda, we're, we're, we just, we're down to 30 seconds here for Bernie to respond. Okay. And, and one other thing, I just wanted to say, people need to start realizing that the government, the big, too big government, is us. It's right. us that's in this government. Okay. That's right. I mean, Linda, your, your last point is absolutely right. The American people are the government. Do we have problems running the government? Sure we do. But it's very different than a private corporation owned by a handful of people. Now, Linda raises some good questions. I won't go into them at great length. Uh, but I do have concerns. I'm on the Health Education Committee, uh, which uh, takes a look at aspects of Medicare. Uh, and Linda makes a very valid point. When Medicare funding goes out to hospitals uh, and academic institutions, they should be doing a lot more, in my view, than they're currently doing. Talk media for the sane among us. Welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. It's our Brunch with Bernie hour, an hour later than normal this week. And Senator Bernie Sanders on the line. Jason in Denver, you're on the air with Bernie. Okay, I just wanted to say, first, Bernie, uh, thank you so much for your leadership in the Senate and um, all that you do. I I love your um, uh, the email that comes in. I read it all the time, and I definitely follow what's going on. I just had a question for you, um, uh, you know, especially out here in Colorado, and I used to live in Arizona, a lot of... Uh, conservatives who are hardworking people um, don't make a lot of money. They hate the government right. and they, 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 they despise the government. You know, private everything, private sector can do better. You know, all that jazz. Right. I just wanted to know how many people, and this is also to you, Tom. How many people do you guys interact with? Would you say that you know uh, fit that mold? They absolutely hate the government. They you know they work. They make they make twenty five you know twenty thousand dollars a year. They might live with their mom. They might you know they, they have a poverty level income. You know, so I just wanted well, to here's know. Here's what's going on, Jason. You raise a very very important issue. It's one that over the years Tom and I have often discussed. The American people, the middle class, the working class of this country is being battered being battered. Real wages are going down. Unemployment is far too high. We're losing jobs to China, etc., etc. And people are angry. And what right-wing politicians have been successful in doing is in certain parts of the country, not in other parts, not in Vermont by and large, for example, uh, but in, in, in uh, certainly in the South and in other parts of this country, they've taken this anger and they say, you're working longer hours for low wages. You know what the cause of that is? It's the government. It's the government. Uh, and, you know, because in many of these states there is not a progressive political opposition to say, excuse me, wasn't the government that caused the Wall Street crisis uh, of 2008? Well, that wasn't the government. It's not the government that's shipping your jobs to China. It's not the government that's breaking your unions. It's not the government that's charging you 25% interest on your credit card. Yeah, we can make the government better. No question about it. Government you know, does a lot of things that are dumb. But we can make it better. But what these guys, the anti-government people, for all intent and purposes, end up representing the wealthiest people and the largest corporations uh, in this country. And our job is to really focus our discussion 
on the needs of working people and start doing a good, a much better educational effort uh, than we have done up to date. Pat in Oswego, New York. Pat, you're on the air with Senator Bernie Sanders. Good afternoon, Senator. Thank you very much for taking my call. I, uh, I, I want to tell you, first and foremost, I watched your entire uh, talking filibuster, <laughs> as much of it that was broadcast, and I enjoyed it. I appreciated it. Thank, Thank you very you. much for doing it. My question is, is there any way that, is it, is it public knowledge these people that send in the, the, the silent uh, filibuster, the, uh, they have their aides call it in or whatever? Right. Uh, we are making, I believe, some progress in that. What Pat is talking about is, uh, and I think we have made some progress, what Pat is saying is that a staffer representing a senator can call in and say, we're putting a hold uh, on that bill, which means you have to get 60 votes. So I think what we're moving toward, one of the recent reforms, as I understand it, is that that senator himself or herself is going to have to come down to the floor and say, uh, I, you know, I, uh, I, I want to start talking about this, uh, and I'm going to filibuster it. So How do you we can't do it through a staff person? I think that is one of the reforms that recently has been developed. And, and I should I should note for our caller that uh, your filibuster is now available in book form. It's called the Speech right. um, by Bernie Sanders. Um, Bernie, just a, a quick question from me here, if I may. Um, how do we find out who uh, put the filibuster on yesterday when 51 votes uh, said, yes, let's fix the sequestration? Well, I think that would not be a secret. I mean, I, I think that one, uh, I, I, I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was the leader, uh, yeah, Mitch McConnell. Probably Mitch McConnell. He's yeah, probably right. actually probably. I mean, what, what, I mean, that's a big vote, and everyone's watching it, and yeah. so it wouldn't surprise me if that was the leadership. But uh, on some of the other pieces of legislation which – the nation is not focused on, you could just have somebody saying, hey, you know, I'm going to filibuster it, and I want 60 votes. Okay. Howard in Hollywood, Florida. You're on the air with Senator Sanders. Hi. I'd like to thank you both for your work. I have a fun thing for you to do, Senator. I can use some fun things. I would like you to approach the Congress, particularly the Republican Congress, and say you have an answer for entitlements. Have them do the same thing in private industry that they did with the post office. Have corporations put up 75 years of money in advance <laughs> over a 10-year period, and they would have no excuse to say no to that because it must be a good thing. They've done it to the post office. Well, that is an interesting point, Howard. Um, Needless to say, I, I don't think I would get all that much support from our Republican friends. Uh, but Howard is pointing out, and he's absolutely correct, is there is no entity in the United States of America, no government agency, no private sector company, no corporation, that has an onerous burden like the U.S. Postal Service in terms of prefunding future retiree health care needs. None. And that is causing somewhere around 78% of the financial problems of the Postal Service. And uh, Howard makes a good point. Bernie, just one minute to the end of the uh, hour. Thoughts, final thoughts for the day? Yeah, I wanted to give, you know, as we look at the first day of sequestration and our Republican friends saying, my goodness, we just, we just don't want to raise any more revenue. Tom, let me give you just one example of how you can raise revenue. In the year 2010, Bank of America set up over 200 subsidiaries in the Cayman Islands, which has a corporate tax rate of zero. As a result of that, the Bank of America did not pay a nickel in federal income taxes and, in fact, got a rebate from the IRS to the tune of $1.9 billion. Wow. Now, what do you think? You think we might want to address that issue before we cut education? I think that would be golden. Social security. That would be golden. Bernie, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you.